Welcome to Ethical Hacking Essentials Module 1. And here in Module 1, what we're going to have a look at is information security fundamentals. Uh, what we're going to do with information security fundamentals is we're going to, number one, understand the need for information security. We're going to look at the elements of information security, and we're going to look at the security, functionality, and usability triad. And we're going to look at motives and goals for attacks uh, on information security. Uh, we're going to look at the classification of attacks. So what kind of attacks are there, et cetera. And we're also going to look at attack vectors. And lastly, about some laws and regulations regarding information security. So let's start with number one. Here in number one, we're going to be looking at discussing information security fundamentals. So what is information security? Well, we have information. Uh, information is actually different than data. Information has meaning. And as such, it's more valuable. And uh, what we want to do with that information is secure it, right? I have a little bit of a state of well-being of that information uh, in that infrastructure with respect to the possibility of theft or tampering or disruption of that information. So what we want to do is keep the threat of theft, tampering, disruption either low or to a tolerable level and really zero theft or tampering uh, is even better. So we want to keep it as low and tolerable as possible. So the need for security is is great. It's a huge need for security. Uh, one of the reasons is of the evolution of technology. We are, we are evolving technology so quickly uh, that uh, we have let security get away from us in some cases. Um, and that technology is not focused on security. Usually it's focused on ease of use. We want to make it as easy to use as possible. Also, we rely on computers for everything, accessing, providing, storing information, and we have network environments of various types, from on-premise networks to, uh, to the cloud, to IoT, to uh, OT networks, to wired networks uh, of various types, to wireless networks of various types. Man, quite a lot. Now we look at the impact of security breaches uh, to the corporate, and, and just, not just corporate, but let's say uh, to the organization, right? Because uh, maybe you're not a corporation. Maybe you are a family in, in a house and one of the family members got hit by uh, some type of attack. Or maybe you're a nonprofit organization. Uh, no matter what you are, uh, we don't want you to fall prey to security attacks. So that's why we need uh, information security so much. Uh, also, we have complexity that increases layer upon layer in infrastructure and administration and management of information security systems. Uh, that complexity also leads to attack. So we have a need for security. So let's look at some of the elements of information security. The first one we see is the idea of confidentiality. When you see that term, think of encryption. We want to make sure that only authorized people have access to the information. Then integrity. When you think of integrity, think of digital certificates or maybe even hashes. What we want to do is make sure that the information has not been changed irrespective of what medium it goes through and who sent it or received it. It hasn't been changed. Then we look at authenticity. We want to make sure we know who it is who has conducted the exchange of the information uh, because we want each party to authenticate. We know who they are. Non-repudiation. We want to make sure that the sender of the message can't say, I didn't do it. I never sent that message. They can't deny having sent it. Why? 
because there are identifiers bound up in the message that are inextricably linked to the sender. So we know that the sender did it. And through all of these elements, we want to make sure that the data, the information, the communication is available, uh, allowing us to deliver and store and process information uh, as an authorized user. I want to be able to get to it. I want to log into, uh, open up uh, my resources and make use of them, make sure they're available, uh, even though I have encryption and digital certificates and um, uh, IPsec and uh, drive encryption and other, other security items going on, I still want to have my data available. All right, so in terms of functionality, so I have security, I have all these restrictions, I have login, I have encryption, et cetera. Um, but I have also features. So I have uh, application developers that allow me to do all kinds of stuff with the software. Um, but in order to use those features, it's very nice to have usability or have a nice graphical user interface and buttons and 3D animations when I click on a menu. It's all nice to have around. Uh, so uh, which one of these is going to be featured the most? So for instance, if I have security, I may not be able to use those nice, the nice functionality of the usability. Or if I have too much usability, maybe I have less security, right? So we're always kind of uh, bouncing around between these, uh, trying to move as close to security as possible, keeping functionality and usability around too. So there are security challenges. So uh, let's say that you are a corporation and it is the uh, 80s and, uh, or, or, and you're running your organization just like normal, uh, but then a company called Enron implodes, taking down billions of dollars. And then Congress and the Senate, Senate meet and they pass laws and now there is a set of laws called Sarbanes-Oxley or SOX. And guess what you have to do? Comply. So now you have laws and regulations. And let's say that uh, your organization merges with an organization that works with clinics and hospitals. And now you have HIPAA. And then let's say that you decide to start doing government contracts. And now you have FISMA. It goes on and on. You have uh, laws and regulations that you must comply with. And then we have security challenges uh, like lack of qualified and skilled cyber security professionals. Now, I hope, I hope right now that you will help us solve this by being one of the qualified and skilled cyber security professionals, right? So we have such a fast growing area in technology and IT that we don't have enough skilled workers. So I'm glad you're in this class. Difficulty for centralizing security in a distributed computing environment. So you have a large organization like a corporation uh, that has on-premise data centers. Uh, they have uh, connections to Azure and AWS cloud providers. Uh, they have manufacturing arms that have uh, IoT and OT networks. They have Wi-Fi networks and Bluetooth and it just gets crazy. Lots of Potential security problems distributed all need to be secured. Also, we have a fragmented and complex privacy and data protection uh, regulation industry. So which, which uh, data protection law or regulation am I under? It's hard to figure out sometimes. And sometimes it even takes a professional and legal help for larger organizations to put that together. And then we have compliance issues because we have people who bring their own devices. Uh, we have tablets and we have phones and so on. And we have these policies in the organization, but then we have compliance and we have to make sure they work together. And then we have relocation of sensitive data from legacy data centers where we used to just have them in a file server and then we backed it up onto tape and now it's in multiple cloud structures. And what if it's not configured appropriately to protect that data? Tell you what, there are many different security challenges and uh, it's usually 
not just one of these, but a combination of most, if not all, of these security challenges. Now, what happens is there are entities, people, uh, attackers out there that want to get to your data. And so they have motives and goals. They have objectives. Uh, but you know what? They can't attack you unless they have this equation solved, right? So uh, let's say that there is a medium-sized business uh, and they have a website. And the website uh, is used all the time. And uh, it helps bring in money, helps direct users to information. Um, but this website has a lot of vulnerabilities in it, right? Why isn't it attacked? Well, maybe, maybe nobody knows about it. Maybe no one has tried to scan it. Maybe it hasn't been paid attention to. So uh, there is no goal or motive to attack the website, even though there are methods to take it down, even though there are vulnerabilities on the website. There is no motive, all right? So uh, uh, then again, you can have a company. Let's say you have a company and this company has uh, a, uh, uh, a website, a web application, and there's a group of hackers, attackers, um, threat actors that hate that company. And so they're hacking away and trying, but guess what? There's no vulnerability. There's no way to get into it and they're continually frustrated. Oh, that would be nice. We, we want to stop people from attacking. So it's all three of these that you need to be able to have a, a, an attack. So the motive originates out of the notion that the target system stores or processes or contains something valuable, and so the attackers want to have at it. So those attackers want to exploit the vulnerabilities in the system and uh, what are the motives? Uh, they just might want to break that business. Uh, they might steal information. They might want to create fear and chaos. I'm just getting chaos, uh, disrupting the critical infrastructures. They might want to steal money, financial loss. They might want to damage the rep of the target and make them look bad. Yeah, this company is bad. So there are many different things that they may, might want to do. So um, let's look at attacks. Uh, there are several different types of attacks in terms of classification. A passive attack, they're just looking around. So for instance, let's say that uh, they're watching, they're sitting, let's say there's someone in a parking lot, they have a laptop, and they're looking at the Wi-Fi traffic, just sniffing it, looking at what traffic happens. They're not uh, causing anything to happen, uh, it's just passively listening, or uh, maybe, Somebody in one building has a parabolic antenna and they're looking at the vibrations of the window in the conference room of the building across the way and listening in on the meeting in the conference room, right? That's passive. They're not actively interacting. Or they're going to LinkedIn and reading information about employees or about the company. Or they're going to a job site looking for jobs that are being advertised to see what types of protocols and programs that company has that they're hiring employees to help with, those are all passive. There is no interaction, it's passive. An active attack is when you tamper with, you change things, you interact with, or you may even disrupt communications uh, by conducting an attack like a man in the middle of session hijacking or SQL injection. You know, an active attack is also if instead of just uh, parking outside of the organization with a listening device, you just go into the front desk and you ask for information. You have now gone active. You're interacting uh, with the target of your attack. A close in attack is when there is close physical proximity. So for instance, uh, people have been attacked from across the world quite a lot, but what if they're in the building next door 
Or what if uh, the person is dressed like a uh, delivery person, but really they're an attacker inside the organization with access to systems now where they can plug in stuff and gather and, uh, and, and disrupt and access to things. So for instance, uh, a close-in attack can be social engineering or eavesdropping right there inside the organization. Or, or maybe uh, standing there looking casual, but really uh, shoulder surfing, reading what somebody is typing or writing. Or maybe somebody throws away an important document and somebody takes it out of the trash and uses it in an attack. Uh, we also have insider attacks. This is when somebody who works for the company violates the rules, intentionally causing damage, destruction uh, to the organization. Like for instance, uh, stealing a physical device. So they may steal a laptop or a tablet or, or something like that. And that device might have information on it that can damage the organization if it gets out of the organization. Or they may stay a little bit late and look like they're working late and then making sure everyone's gone off the floor, go in their pocket and pull out a little key logger. Have you seen these before? Watch, try this. Open up a tab in your browser right now and in DuckDuckGo or in Google, type in key logger. See this word right here? Just type it in key logger and then go to shopping. If you go to shopping, you'll see the key logger is a little USB dongle. So if somebody stayed late, let's say they spent uh, 200 bucks, bought uh, three or four or five of the key loggers, uh, they can find the, uh, the attack target. Let's say they uh, go plant one in behind the PC of the supervisor, go plant one behind the PC of the uh, financial person, etc., and then they can collect the data. Right? Or they can have a flash drive and plant a black back door, malware, all kinds of stuff, right? These are insider attacks. And then we have distribution attacks. And they tamper with hardware or software before it even makes it uh, to the site. So, like for instance, I've worked for many uh, organizations in the IT department where we had agreements with Dell or agreements with HP that when we got PCs or servers delivered, uh, they would have them pre-configured for us with our own images on them. That would save a lot, of, a lot of, of time. And so what can happen with a distribution attack is somebody can interfere with that at one of those companies, and when we get the PC, it's compromised. Uh, these are very similar, but it's a little bit different, uh, to supply chain attacks where something like that happens with the distribution of software. So for instance, you have a Ubuntu Linux box and you're doing an update, but little do you know, uh, somebody has changed the update parameters so that uh, there is a malicious update that's coming in from an official source, right? Uh, that could be like a supply chain attack. So distribution attacks, supply chain attacks, there are all kinds of attacks that can happen to organizations. So what are the attack vectors? Uh, we have cloud computing threats. So for instance, we have all these wonderful on-demand services that we can get from cloud providers. Uh, but there's a possibility of sensitive data leakage. We could have uh, flaws in the way that the application works. Uh, there are many different ways that the cloud communication can be tampered with. There are the idea of advanced persistent Threats. I was called to do a cons some consulting for an organization that they had. They were doing um, uh, real estate uh, property management for commercial real estate, and uh, the problem was though that uh, there was an email that was sent out to all of their clients that said, "For your convenience, we have made it better for you to pay." Your, your lease. And remember, this is commercial real estate. If, you, if, you're, if you're leasing or renting a house for your family, it might be you know $2,000, $1,000 a month. But if you have commercial real estate, it could be 
$10,000, $50,000 on up a month for the commercial real estate. And we have a new way for you to pay. All you have to do is click on this link and you, or use this ACH number and you can conveniently pay for your lease. So a few of their clients actually did that, but somebody said, excuse me, why are you changing the way we pay? And the people at the company said, oh, we didn't change the way you pay. They sent them a sample of the email. The email was sent officially from that company uh, on their official email. What had happened was somebody had attacked the network. They had stayed there inside the network, full access, and figured out a way where they could steal money. That was an advanced, persistent threat. Do you know what the average amount of time that it takes for an organization to figure out that they've been attacked and have an attacker inside their network hacking away at stuff? Do you know what the average amount of time it is? What do you think? It is 208 days. That's the better part of a year that somebody can be camped out in your network attacking it. So that's an APT. We have worms and viruses. Big difference between a worm and a virus. Now, both of them are sophisticated codes that are able to infect. But just like in biology, a virus needs a vector. Right? So if somebody has a disease and their hand is sweaty and covered with the disease and I shake their hand and do, do I now have the disease? No, actually, uh, there might be a billion viruses on my hand, but I don't have the disease. They're not going to crawl up my, my arm. In fact, if I quickly go wash my hands, the viruses are gone. But if I shake somebody's hand and then it feels really clammy and weird, I'm like, oh man, I think that dude is sick. And I start eating my potato chips and I transfer the virus from my hand to the potato chip, from the potato chip into my mouth, well, then I'm in big trouble, right? So viruses need a transport in biology and in technology. But worms, let's say that you're in the garden, growing a nice big garden in the backyard, and uh, it's a, you know, a, a summer a morning, and you dig up a big chunk of the garden, and then you get a phone call, and you're talking on the phone. And meanwhile, guess what? A worm comes out and it just starts crawling on its own. Worms don't need transport. They'll transport themselves. So in the world of computers, a virus might need your uh, email application in order to send itself. And if you don't have an email application, it might not even work. The virus not, may not be able to do anything else, but it can send itself using your email application. The email application is the viral vector. Uh, however, a worm, let's say I have a laptop, I take it to a network, the worm says, hey, cool, a network. And the worm crawls out of my laptop and starts just finding all kinds of other ports that are open on other devices that are connected to the network and spreads itself. No need for a vector. So big diff between worms and viruses, keep that in mind. Just match it up to biology, you'll be fine. Ransomware, um, have you ever heard of ransomware? Me either. What's that? I've never heard of that. Just kidding. If, you, if you've watched any news, if you work for any organization, you've heard of ransomware, right? Where uh, a screen pops up, it's a splash screen on your, computer, on your computer, and it says, all your files have been locked. If you want to unlock your files, uh, send us five bitcoins before 11.30 a.m. tomorrow or 48 hours or whatever locking all the files. And some threat actors will actually not only lock all the files of a big organization, but they will take a sample, uh, or not a sample, they'll just even take it all, all the data they can get, gigabytes of data, and they'll say, if you don't pay us, then we will uh, drop this data on the internet for anyone to see. And so uh, ransomware can be pretty bad. And then we also have mobile threats. A lot of us think our phones are safe. Why? Because the phone hasn't ever been attacked that we know of before. And you don't see a lot of information about phones, mobile devices, tablets being attacked in the news. But for those of us who deal with cybersecurity, 
we know that phones, mobile devices, are a definite vector for attack. So what I tell all my students, what I tell uh, all my uh, clients uh, and other people is, on your phone, where's my phone? Here's my phone, right here. You need antivirus on your phone. We'll get to that a little bit later. We get to mobile security later on in the class. Other vectors, botnet, specifically for IOTs and mobile phones, they can become botnets where they become the source of the attack and they're controlled by a controller. Insider attacks, where somebody who's trusted, who works for the organization, or a consultant, or somebody who's on the inside attacks the network. Phishing, where an email or a text or some other type of communication that looks legitimate and appeals to the person is actually an attack, trying to acquire information. Web application threats, where you are trying to just get to a website, download it, uh, you're trying to download a web app and use it, but you get attacked. Something happens and they try to uh, redirect you or steal information or get you to click on a link that will become a threat. Or IoT, you have devices, Internet of Thing based devices uh, that are compromised, compromisable, and they become a threat to the organization because of flaws in these devices that allow the attacker to remotely perform attacks based on that device. 